that, we are honored to introduce you the next panel. Radical Education Equals Radical Change, featuring the Yaya Network, Rosedale Freedom Project, DMLK's No Justice, No Peace, and the International Indigenous Youth Council, the Chicago Chapter. The panel will be moderated by renowned educator and author, Noliwe Rooks. Rooks is a W.E.B. Dubois professor in the Africana Studies and Research Center at Cornell University and the author of Cutting School, Privatization, Segregation, and the End of Public Education. Remember, if you want to ask a question to our panelists, use the Q&A box. Please welcome Professor Rooks, Emmy, Vanessa, Kalia, Dani to the stage. Hi everybody, hi, hi. Uh, I'm so thrilled to be here with the panelists and just to be a part of uh, this event as, as a whole. It's, it's, uh, it does the heart good, as people say. Uh, I want to start off with just asking you all on the panel to please just introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Emmy. I'm a youth facilitator at the Yaya Network. Um, and the Yaya Network is a youth advocacy group fighting for social and economic justice. Um, we offer leadership and organizing training through several different programs that we um, have at Yaya and we use political education to help participants uh, become effective social justice activists and organizers. Thank you. Uh, why don't we go to Vanessa? Hey, I'm Vanessa. I'm 16 years old and I'm from Rosa, Mississippi. I'm a part of the Rosa, Rosa Freedom Project. The Rosa Freedom Project is a place where kids and adults can come together to learn, take action, and support our community. The RP comes together almost every day to talk about politics, situation in our personal schools, and so much more. And we don't just sit and talk, we take action. We start our own march for Black Lives Matter. We participate in I IAJE, which is an immigration night for justice and equity, and we do so much more. We have little fundraisers for our community, and we support each other. We want to make a difference in our community. We want to give ourselves and our future generation a better future. You can check out the Rose and Freedom Project at roseandfreedom.org. Thank you. Uh, Kalia? Um, yes, hi. My name is Kalia. I'm a sophomore at Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Early College in Denver, Colorado. I'm one of the co-hosts of the No Justice, No Peace podcast, and I'm also one of the co-founders of the Black Student Alliance at my school, DMLK. And the No Justice, No Peace podcast basically was started during the summer um, where George Floyd was murdered. And it was born out of knowing that we couldn't stay silent anymore. And basically throughout the podcast, we talked about our experience as minorities in America. And we've introduced uh, legislation and a resolution into Denver Public School to get more black and BIPOC history. Thank you. Uh, and Denai, am I saying your name right? Dani, it's Dani. Dani, I'm so sorry. Dani, I have a name. Given my name, I usually I try to be really good about other people's names. Dani. Yeah, thank you. So I first want to start off by saying thank you all for having me in this space, and I'm very grateful for it. I am Dani. I am 19 years old, and I am the representative of International Indigenous Youth Council in Chicago. And it was started and led by women and two spirit people during Standing Rock Indigenous Uprising in 2006, while peacefully protecting Missouri rivers against the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline. Through the chapter model, we have several chapters of solidarity in Turtle, across Turtle Island, and I am part of the Chicago one. And we also focus on restorative justice and on youth leadership in our communities. Thank you. This is so amazing to have students in college, in, in high school, who are already so deeply engaged um, in the work of change and advocacy. One of the things uh, I want to ask you about is wherever you are, um, you, you know, you're engaged in education, as, as have we all been. Can you just talk a little bit about what you think of as the real value of education? Uh, and uh, how your advocacy tries to shift um, the, the nature of what we talk about, what we think about 
um, as education for the better. So just what do you think education actually is and how does the advocacy work that you do um, shift that thinking for us and for you? Um, let's start, let's go backwards. Let's, <laughs> let's start where we stopped. With, with uh, uh, Danny. Okay, thank you. Um, I feel like restorative justice being implemented in, for example, Chicago public schools or just public schools in general in black and brown neighborhoods especially is really important because relationship building and community building is very important in order for a community to, to, to thrive in face of oppression, in face of injustice. And we, the whole word, the whole word around solidarity is uniting black and indigenous and brown people because we are the ones who are perpetually and historically being colonized. And, and you could see modern day colonization through gentrification, through redlining, and these these community communities face environmental racism and a lot of health issues and and therefore an organization like this like international indigenous youth council in chicago we help we help the community by bringing in our elders who teach us our traditional ways of restorative justice and peace circles and peace talks and that being implemented in CPS, for example, is the way to, to start change in some type of way. Thank you, going backwards, Kalia. Um, thank you, and I believe that the true value of education, um, I feel like one thing we say very often as a podcast is that education is liberation. Like when you go all the way back to slavery and segregation, when black people were given an education and given the resources to be smart, we did amazing things. And in the public school education system, especially with how messed up it is for students of color and black students, a lot of students take their education for granted because it really has nothing to do with them as a person. So I feel like the value of education is not only taking in as much information as possible, but to also build yourself up and become powerful and actually use that information to your advantage, whether it has to do with your identity or not but it helps especially when it has to do with your identity and just the idea that like especially with our goal of getting black history it's so important because I feel like just from reading things like Frederick Douglass's what is fourth of July to the slave it empowered me so much as a black person just reading a, a piece of text and I feel like the advocacy we're doing and not just some piece is really important in the shift of education around us because um trying to get more Black BIPOC history into DPS is especially important because it's something we've been seriously lacking in for a long time. And it's not, I feel like the work we're doing right now is generally just flipping the conversation of race and equity and how students can empower themselves and be empowered in schools every single day. Thank you. Vanessa? Um, to me, the true value of education is learning about important things in our in our own country, not just what our white ancestors did. We need to learn about other races, what they have done, what they like. Um, we learn mostly what our white old presidents did. We never learn what our black presidents did, or what our or just any other nature of that. We just learn about white white people. We don't. African Americans get one month throughout their whole school year to talk about their ancestors. We, other races don't get that. Uh, throughout the year, it's just white people, what they did and what they haven't done, or what they did and national things they did. When we talk about other races in our school, well, in my school personally, we learn about the bad things they did, like during the war and other natures of that. We don't talk about the most important and educational things they have done. And to me, that's wrong. We should learn about other races and what they have done in our school. I mean, not in our school, in our country that changed us, that led us to where we are now. But doing, doing that is just talking about 
what white people did. We're going to go to college. I ain't going to say looking dumb, but we're going to look uneducated. Like we didn't have a good education because of what we learned in our school. Mm-hmm. And I just think that's not right. And we should learn more about our race. You want a more complete and culturally responsive kind of education. Thank you. All right, last but not least, Emmy. Yeah, so I completely agree with all my fellow panelists, um, especially about restorative justice and culturally responsive education. I think those are both really important um, aspects of our advocacy work and um, organizing. Um, And personally, I think that education is valuable because it um, teaches youth uh, to become active members of their communities. And it also gives us the tools um, to create change and you know, build ourselves up and build up our communities um, and, you know, improve our communities and improve uh, our quality of life. Um, And I think that through advocacy, uh, we are working primarily at Yaya to combat the school to prison pipeline. So that means getting police and metal detectors out of our schools and getting more counselors into our schools. Um, Also, we really value culturally responsive education um, as an important aspect of uh, education, especially for youth of color. Um, Because if you are not seeing your identity reflected in what you're learning, um, and all you're seeing is that you're being criminalized from a young age, your people expect you to come into school doing criminal activity, you're not seeing uh, black leaders, you're not seeing leaders that look like you that come from um, your walk of life, you're, you internalize that, you internalize the racism, you internalize, um, you know, that colonization and um, Mm -hmm. it brings you down. And so if we can change that um, through restorative justice and culturally responsive education, then I think that youth of color will have the power and knowledge to create um, change effectively in their communities. Yeah, thank you. I wanna say someone in the chat, um, Latina called and said, all youth need windows and mirrors. I like that. Like, I like that framing is kind of summing up um, what you got, what you all said in response to that first question. You know, we need windows, ways to go through to another side. Uh, and we need mirrors, something that reflects back uh, who we are and who we want to be. So thank you all so much for that. Um, the next question, Emmy, let's stay with you. I, I want to uh, ask you specifically at Yaya and tell the audience, you know, what Yaya stands for, Y-A-Y-A, um, what you're gesturing toward there, what you're naming um, with the title of the organization. And uh What does political organization look like there and how is it connected to activism and organizing? Um, So YAYA stands for Youth Activists and Youth Allies, like uh, Youth Activists dash Youth Allies. Um, And so political education is a really important part of um, of YAYA. So we offer a few different programs, um, including the Summer Institute and uh, Empower Fellowship. Um, And those, a big part of those is uh, politically educating uh, participants. So that includes uh, kind of reflecting on yourself and thinking critically about your own views and ideas um, and kind of decolonizing uh, your own perspective and, um, you know, thinking critically about hegemony and, um, you know, kind of transforming your own, uh, beliefs, uh, to, uh, unite with the Yaya community around social justice issues. Um, and we think that's really important because, uh, when you gain those skills to think critically about yourself and think critically about, the world around you, then you, um, you know, gain a complete understanding of the work that needs to be done. And you can also come up with your own ideas for work that needs to be done. And it also helps us all unite as a community around um, specific issues. Uh, And so we 
um, yeah, we can unite around those issues and then the organizing becomes more effective because we're all on the same page and we all are fighting for the same thing and uh, we become a lot more powerful that way. And um, we also gain the skills to influence um, policy and, you know, oppressive institutions and systems. And we, uh, when we gain a, a strong understanding of that, I think that we become more effective social justice organizers. Yeah, like a nice 360, not just one thing. Um, yeah. Uh, someone is asking where you guys are located. So Yaya is in New York City primarily, yes? Um, and then uh, the next question that I wanna ask is to Vanessa and you are in Mississippi, is that right? Yeah. Um, and what I wanna ask you, um, as you talk a little bit, most of the other organizations um, that are on the call on this panel today are from larger urban um, areas or big cities and you live and work in rural Mississippi. So can you tell us a little bit about Rosedale and about your school? Of course. Um, well, Rosedale Freedom Project is in Rosedale, but we do have communities that around Rosedale that come together as one. So Rosedale is a, is a population with about 873. And it's small, I do know that. But our population cannot fool you. Well, that city where future world-known doctors will come from, future world-known lawyers, and so much more are coming from. We may be small, but we don't do small things. We participate in so much more. And thanks to the Frida Project, we just don't have schools to educate us, but we had them to teach us about history, politics, and so much more. I first got involved with the Freedom Project because I wanted to raise my ATT score. And because of them, I was honored to receive a 19 composite ACT score at the age of 16. And I just want to thank them and my school. Because of my school, I was able to do that. And that's why I said, Rosa may be small, but we part but we are so much bigger than that. Um, we may not have the best school system, but we do have the Rosa and Freedom Project to help us when we do need help. And our our schools our not school our town may be small, but last year our football team won district champs and we were so happy about that. <laughs> sports are but, big, <laughs> man. Yeah, sports are big. Sports right are big. Oh. Uh huh. Um, the basketball team. I think they won district champs too. I'm not involved in basketball like I am football, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure they did. And I just want to say that Roseville is small. But we have so much possible like opportunities that we can pursue. Look, they raised you. They raised you well. So <laughs> they're doing <laughs> something right. That's what we can say. <laughs> mm -hmm. For the second time, I'm gonna be quiet and let somebody go next. Uh, let's see, uh, Kalaya. Uh, let's ask ask. Oh, Vanessa, are you raising your hand? Do you mean to raise your hand, Vanessa? I am. <laughs> Okay, um, uh, let's talk about media a little bit. Um, we know that media can really be a really powerful tool for education in a number of different ways. And I know that you co-host a podcast called The Take. Um, so tell us about that. Tell us about your podcast uh, and make sure you let us know where we can subscribe and what we'll hear. What is the focus? What's, what is it that you're digging into in that podcast? Absolutely. And let me know if I go off on a tangent because our story, even though we've only been going for about a year, it's a lot. Um, so just from the beginning, the four girls on the podcast, me, Donnie Austin, Alana Mitchell, and Janelle Ninga, we all go to my school, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Early College. And it basically started with our BSA and our BSA formed when we went to Washington DC in about October of 2019. And while we were there, we went to um, this, the Smithsonian Museum of African-American History and Culture, Howard University, a ton of monuments around Washington. And on our very last night there, we all kind of broke down. We had like this big group conversation. And that, like, that last night before we went back to Denver, we basically all agreed to start our own Black Student Alliance. 
and basically our goal once we got back to our school we were talking with our history teachers we were talking with district people we were talking with like really big people to be honest and one of our main goals was to audit our curriculum at our school and at DPS to include more black and people of color history and of course with the pandemic that kind of slowed everything down and kind of put a pause on the BSA but now we're starting to get that started back up which I'm really excited for but during the summer, I think as I said before in my introduction, um, after George Floyd died, we kind of all realized we couldn't really be silent about racial injustice anymore. And Janelle, one of the girls on the podcast, it was her idea to start a podcast. And like that that has a bunch of stuff on itself, but we're now on our second series where after, well, let me go back a little bit. In October of last year, 2020, we proposed and it was an, a unanimously, unanimously accepted our No Justice, No Peace resolution, which would basically give our superintendent about a year to get BIPOC history all throughout Denver Public Schools, which is a pretty big task, but the school board voted unanimously on it. And that's something we're really proud of. And with the podcast right now, we're just talking about um, how people are going to sustain it and keep it going with our shift in superintendents. But with the main, now that all that history is out of the way, with the main thing with our podcast, um, mainly we talk about things that pertain to us as all black women and just the minority experience in America. We interview people, we interview, um, I know we in, recently in our most recent series, we interviewed the authors of Black History Thesis 5, an amazing black textbook that we've partnered with. Um, we, uh, we interviewed our last superintendent, our interim superintendent, um, some of the people we collaborated with in our school district. Um, just amazing people in general, community figures, just amazing, amazing people. And we just really want our audience to be educated about not only our experience as Black women and Black students and Black student advocates, but also just get as many perspectives as possible when it comes to equitable and culturally responsive education. Thank you. Somebody in the chat is asking one more time. It's no K-N-O-W justice, right? Yep. Here, I can yep. type in the chat. And um, okay. I think yeah, I think oh, people people, people have your back. They are all yeah. over it. So the no justice and K and O W piece. Um, that's amazing. Yeah. Oh, very sorry. That's our name on all social medias. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And how can people subscribe? Just just go. Just if they look you up, there's a button or someplace where people can subscribe to the podcast. Yes, I will be really specific. Okay, so. Our main Facebook, where we post all of our updates and our episodes, that's No Justice, No Peace, DMO Case to Take. Um, all of our old episodes are on our school YouTube page, um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Early College, but now we have our own YouTube channel of the same name, No Justice, No Peace, DMO Case to Take. Um, it's the same name on Twitter and Instagram as um, Ms. Kimberly just put in the chat. So basically the same on all social medias. All right. And hopefully the audience will. Uh, I'm going to be registering. I will be listening going for it. Um, and then, Den Denny, okay, and I'm screwing up your name again. It was Danny, right? It's or Danny. Whatever. Danny, sorry. I, you know, we went over this. Like, you would think I could hold on to it for like 10 minutes, but no, Danny. Um, Danny, I know that the uh, International Indigenous Youth, um, the Chicago chapter of, of your organization, has really embraced art also. It means we have podcasting and then um, art as a form of expression and activism. Can, can you just talk some about what that means when, when, when you say that the organization has embraced art and how you um, see art as related in this movement um, to activism? Yes, of course. So art has always been at the front lines of social justice movements in general since like decades ago. And art is a form of revolution within itself. It allows us to express our feelings, our emotions, or whatever is going on. And we in the Chicago chapter have hosted open mics, poetry slams, stuff like that for our youth and for our community members to come in and express whatever they want. And we also facilitate restorative, just, restorative justice circles and like peace circles as a way to help as well. And there's this word that came to mind, artivism, and it's art mixed with activism, conjuncted. And we have been like honored to be working with local Chicago organizations to 
form like grocery bags and we also worked on our COVID-19 committee for Southwest Relief and we assembled, assembled over 500 PPE kits combined and we collected supplies for our Southwest reservations. And we have done a lot of community work, but also our youth also want to work on art. And I, by myself, am an artist as well. And being the representative of the Chicago chapter, we've been creating murals, cleaning up spaces at Semillas y Raices, which is a garden that we use. We chop wood and we grow medicines like sage. So a big shout out to Semillas y Raices for allowing us to be in that space in the first place for us to create murals and host open mics. So, yeah. Thank you. you there are, uh, it looks like there are two questions. Um, if we wanna let Andrew maybe unmute, this is happening behind the scenes. We are going to see um, if this magically works and ask his question about media and art. Andrew Lefkowitz. I'm waiting to see if magically Andrew pops up and starts talking. Otherwise I have another question. Okay, while we're waiting for Andrew to pop up, <laughs> let me ask y'all what, you know, so some of what I know about uh, from back in the day. Um, oh, Andrew is here. Okay, go. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, really uh, honored to be here. I think the panel is so uh, powerful. I'm, I'm wondering if you can speak, and I think um, you touched on this just a little bit with the last question, but but what's the power of, of art? What's the power of other forms of communication? I think uh, particularly uh, white people who engage in social justice work are really good at getting into our heads and reading and uh, going to the book clubs and having the conversations. And I'm wondering, um, yeah, how, how you feel the power of art to reach people maybe in their heart and move the conversation in a different way, whether that be through media like podcast or through um, the poetry that we've heard today, which has been so powerful. Um, just, yeah, we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And thank you so much for, for allowing me on. Uh, uh, all of you, one of you, however you want to take the question. Yeah, hi, hi, Andrew. Thank you for asking that question. I take art as a form of, of revolution because art is so special and meaningful to me as, as an artist and or as a creator. And I put a lot of my emotional work and healing into it. So a lot of my healing and my time and my energy goes into a piece that I hope other people can see the message from, from the art because honestly, art is a form of, of change and it is a tool of change. So that's why art means a lot to me. Yeah, I hope that answered your question. Did someone else wanna, wanna respond to that one? Um, and Vanessa. Oh, Kalia, Kalia and then uh, and then Vanessa. Yeah, I was just gonna say, even though like the work at No Additional Peach, we don't really specialize in art. One thing I can really appreciate just about my community in general out here by Green Valley and Denver is that a lot of like the social justice art is very powerful because a lot of times when people think of activists, they think of people in the streets or people holding up signs or people signing petitions and making petitions, but people don't really acknowledge that art is a very serious and beautiful means of activism. And that's why I always love, like, I remember a couple of weeks ago, me and some of the girls from the podcast, we actually went around Denver looking at all of the Black Lives Matter murals. And it's just beautiful how some people can channel all of their energy and all of their motivation and feelings about social injustice into beautiful pieces of art that can be commemorated for a long time. So that's just like my little bit because I feel like social justice art just really speaks to my heart. Thank you. Vanessa? Um, for me, art is like history. It's because when something national happens in our country, we always have some type of mural or anything come up and if you look at it it's telling our history what happened that made it to where we had our somebody had to draw to draw it they wanted to be remembered so like for black lives matter 
you can go literally anywhere and see any type of mural, any type of graffiti, just things of that nature. And it's so pretty or beautiful because it's it tells history and it tells it tells a story with it as well. And I just find it very beautiful. I love seeing graffiti and mm. murals. I do <laughs> murals all the time. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I stay in Roseville, but a few miles up, you can go to Clarksville, Mississippi, and there are so many graffiti. It is so beautiful because Clarksville is like the heart of blues. And there's like, people have um, painted blues artists or just blues notes, or anything, and it's so beautiful to me. It's telling our history. It's telling us hmm. about Mississippi. <laughs> the art is history, out is power, art is change. You know, like that's that's what I hear y'all uh, say. Are you, Jimmy, did you want to say something? Yeah, yeah. sure. sure, sure. Um, just a quick thing. So I'm not an artist at all, and I don't really participate in um, art at, through as activism um, personally. But uh, I live in Bedford Stuyvesant, which is a, a historically black affluent neighborhood in Brooklyn. Uh, and around the corner from my house, uh, around the time of the Black Lives Matter protests, when they were really, um, you know, popular, I guess, in New York City, before people started, you know faltering out. Um, anyways, so there was this, they co- closed off a section of Fulton Street, which is a really busy street in Brooklyn. Um, and they uh, wrote Black Lives Matter in huge yellow letters, like across the whole street. Um, and the street was closed for a really long time. And just every single day you would go over there and uh, I would just see my community gathering and celebrating and, you know, partying on that, on those letters. And I see black joy as a really, uh, as revolution, as resistance, black joy as resistance. I really believe in that. And um, so I thought that was really powerful to see how art um, can kind of bring people together and give people a reason to celebrate and, uh, congregate and I just think it's really beautiful and I think it's uh revolutionary Hmm. yeah I think in a in a country in a world that never meant for you to survive to paraphrase Audre Lorde a poem that she wrote um uh, it it, art and joy um and, and and love the power to do those take on revolutionary significance um that runs through the activism that I hear you all talk about. It's like activism is a form of devotion, as a form of love, um, as, as a way of affirming your presence um, in the presence of others. Um, it's no small thing. It really isn't. So we're, we're wrapping up here. Let me, let's do a speed round for all of you. We'll start with Vanessa, because that this is how you're laid out on my screen. Um, uh, give me one one minute, 30 seconds to one minute of what you want to leave the people with. What do you want them to most know? What do you want them to walk out of here um, being able to say about you? Um, I would like y'all to say that this plan will really help y'all, you know, see what's going, what we're trying to do to this world, how we're trying to make sure our school systems talk about other races and not just white races and what we can do what we can do to um change that we can we can sign we can like hire other teachers who will do this who will talk about other races you know things of that nature because to me that's one of the most important reasons college for because my my school system doesn't teach other races but we can go to college and we can sign up for classes that do i really want to hear about the Indians. I really want to hear what they did to our country that changed. That's what I want to learn about. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, Kalia. Oh, gosh. Um, I guess one really big thing, especially if you're like a person in legislation or if you're an adult in a position of power or you have the influence to change things, listen to students. Like, I'm not just, like, not even just like post students on your social media or invite them for a meeting and never talk to them again. Listen to the students, 
to take their suggestions, listen to them, get them involved in the conversation, put them in the forefront, let them speak from their own mouths, let them do what they need to do. Because we're like me, I have like two years of high school left and there's so much stuff I want to do. And I feel like honestly, the work we've done as a podcast would be done so much quicker if past generations of students were listened to. And don't let it become a recurring issue of students like telling you there's a problem over and over and over and over again and you just don't listen listen to the students and get what they need to get done done and just uphold their voice don't mask it as your own voice don't try to take credit for it listen to them because you're going to appreciate and they're going to be so strong once they leave your school and you're going to wish you had that power once they were there hmm. you know this is what my students have taught me like when they're feeling something I'm saying, they do with the hand snap. So I'm, I'm giving you all the snaps, like listen to the students, yes. All right, uh, I have Denise next. So I just wanna say thank you all for having me in this space. I'm, I'm very grateful for it. Also, I guess one last thing that I wanna say is that reparations are needed and Open up, open up your pockets for black and brown people in general. And honestly, um, all we can really do is move forward as a society is listening to those who are in these vulnerable positions. And if you really wanna help those people, then you have to go out of your way and give them money, give them resources for them to thrive if you really wanna make that change. So yeah, I guess that's it. And I hope everyone has a great day. You gotta love that reparations are needed. Short, sweet, to the point. All right, take us home, Emmy. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for coming here. I feel so grateful to be, um, you know, talking with these great panelists. And thank you, Dr. Rooks, for uh, moderating this panel. Um, Everyone has been great. I've really enjoyed this. And um, I just feel so uh, empowered when I come to these spaces and I see so many participants and um, I'm just so happy that there are so many people excited to engage in these conversations. So thank you all for um, being here. And I also want to invite everyone to uh, Yaya's People's Playlist. It, uh, is we host a people's playlist once a month and it's just an open uh, space for people to come and talk about um, oppressive issues they see in their communities. And um, yeah, check us out online, Yaya Network. And um, yes, we want to see you all there at the people's playlist. All right, it is data 345. So we are gonna land this ship. I enjoyed this thoroughly. It was my honor. Um, and thank you all for all of those, the 200 and something people who got to learn from you all today. Um, you were a blessing to them. Bye-bye. Hey, thank y'all for listening to us, by the way. <laughs> Absolutely phenomenal job, y'all. Like, you know, if we were in person, I'd say drop the mic, but I guess in this case, just drop drop the dang laptop, just, just drop it. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Professor Rux, Yaya Network, Rosedale Freedom Project, No Justice, No Peace, and the International Indigenous Youth Council, Chicago Sh Chapter, for sharing your collective brilliance and vision with us. Activism, or artivism rather, is truly a lifestyle. We continue to be inspired by young people, not bound by what is, but already envisioning what could and very much should be. 